Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining from. We're so excited to have you here today. Uh, my name is Clara. I am uh, the host of today's webinar. And today we have an amazing topic. I hope everyone enjoyed their uh, five minutes of networking before our event uh, starts. And yeah, we're ready to get to it. Today's topic will be um, really, really a great discussion. We have Brittany from Holler coming to join us in just a few minutes. And we'll be talking about building diversity, uh, inclusion and belonging programs. Uh, so I'm really, really, really passionate about this topic. And I feel like it's it's been a topic that every people, uh, people manager had to tackle in the last year or so. Uh, so yeah, let's get to it. Before I invite Brittany to the stage, let me just share a few um, few information with you uh, on today's webinar. Uh, today's conversation is a panel talk. So um, I have a lot of questions I have prepared for our amazing guest and it is open to discussion. So please feel free to start using the chat box. Please share where you're joining from today. And don't forget to use the Q&A tab. Um, you can ask any questions you like. We'll make sure to uh, you know, go through them from time to time during the discussion. And we'll, we have some extra time at the end to answer all of your questions. We'll be also have a few polls going out to you. So don't forget to vote. And of course, today's conversation is recorded. So uh, if you're short on time and have to run early today, um, we'll make sure to send this conversation to your inbox. Uh, yeah, uh, as you know, this webinar is organized by Gather. Gather is a project management tool specifically designed for people operations. Uh, we're helping uh, small and scaling companies to really master their people ops processes. So if you're curious about how we can help your company to scale your people ops uh, organization, please reach out to uh, teamgather.co. Amazing. So today on stage, we have the amazing Brittany joining us. Um, Brittany, are you are you here with us today? Yep, I'm here. Amazing. All right. So uh, I think we can we can get started with with a quick introduction. Uh, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, would you mind sharing with with all of our guests today? Um, what brings you to this webinar? You know, what's your what's your background and what what's Holler doing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so like uh, Clara said, I'm Brittany. I'm the head of people at Holler. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And really excited to talk to everyone today about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, so thanks again for having me. Um, Holler is a conversational media company. So we focus on creating and delivering content that helps peer-to-peer -peer messages um, be more engaging and, and effective. Um, so, you know, if you are sending payments on Venmo and you see those, um, you know, cute little stickers pop up, those are made by Holler. Um, and as you um, will probably know, they're recommended kind of based on what you're sending a payment for and it works the same in messaging applications. Um, but a little bit about me. So I am, um, I've been in the talent and I guess people uh, space for my entire career. I started in recruiting, um, but the bulk of my experience has been in the people ops space. And, you know, I've um, now on my second startup of um, being the first uh, people ops hire and uh, building and kind of growing the organization. And, you know, nothing gets me more excited professionally than, than kind of building and scaling people departments and operations from scratch. And, um, that goes for our um, diversity program too. So I'm excited to talk about it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for the lovely introduction. We're, we're so happy to have you here. Um, for context, uh, my role at Gather currently is the head of people and community. So uh, we'll be talking, I'll be sharing some of my experience of building uh, these programs as well. All right, let's get to it. I'm really, really happy that you decided to join us today um, to talk about this extremely important topic. And you know, to kind of kick things off, um, what was the first step that you took towards building uh, these kind of programs, um, you know, specifically at, at Holler? Yeah, so really the first thing we did, um, this all kind of came about in our organization, as I'm sure it did in a lot of organizations following um, the murder of George Floyd. So we we really, as a leadership team, kind of took a step back and and recognized that we didn't have the answer. You know, we were we were kind of in shock as um, along with the rest of the world. And so really what we we did is we sourced feedback and we really listened to it, um, especially in those early days. 
you know, I think um, we all probably know at this point, this is a topic that there isn't a playbook for. Um, I think every organization has their own needs and we really wanted to hear from our team before we just started, you know, um, making recommendations on things that we would change. Um, and some of those things that we heard in the early days were, you know, the, the team didn't feel that we had uh, much diversity in our leadership team. Um, I think we have a, a diverse um, employee base, but not on the leadership team. Um, and, you know, we're a black founded and black led company, but the rest of our leadership team didn't really reflect that. Um, you know, we also got some early advice to, to be careful in asking underrepresented groups in the company to educate everyone else. Um, so, you know, uh, I think a lot of companies uh, try to try to grassroots the project and as do we, um, but there mm -hmm. is a time and a place um, for, you know, external uh, resources. And mm -hmm. then um, another thing that people really wanted was prioritizing training and unconscious bias. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we started. Um, and, and I'm glad that we did collect the feedback because if I had approached the topic from my own experience or from what I thought we needed, it probably would have looked very different. Um, so yeah, we collected feedback through a survey and then we also left open an anonymous Google form and that was where people could provide feedback along the way, um, so mm -hmm. that, you know, we weren't just collecting feedback on the, um, at the start, but we were continuing to do so along the way. Absolutely. And I'm so happy that you're mentioning, you know, that you just start, decided to start this way and that you're really happy that you took this approach because, you know, one of the one of the words we mentioned is inclusion. Right. And what's a better way to build inclusion programs than to include your employees in, you know, giving the feedback very early on and then having them follow the journey as you went. Um, so I'm happy that you're you, you shared that you are. I'm glad you took this approach. Um, that's that's really amazing. Um, what would you recommend to our people community as you know, kind of one of the best approaches to getting started with building uh, the DIB programs? So I think the the kind of like first thing that anyone should do is align with their leadership on the importance, mm -hmm. what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, you know, I think if the leadership isn't prioritizing the topic, the team isn't going to either. Um, so that would be kind of like step one. Um, then I would say really create a stance and some guiding principles on, you know, what you want your diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging program to look like, uh, you know, what does it do for the org? How does it operate? And then, you know, a step down from that is what are the tenants of that program that you will hold true to, you know, so this is what we want to do. And this is how we're going to do it. Um, kind of like the pillars of, of how we'll do it. Um, I think is important because um, you want to be able to check, you know, the programs that you're doing, the policies that you're putting into place to something. And I think it's easy to get derailed from what you're trying to do um, mm -hmm. if you don't have those guiding principles. Mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of mentioned this, but, uh, you know, having a baseline survey to the team, I would say is the next step, you know, okay, so leadership spot in, we know what we want to do, let's survey the team so that we can really measure success and see if what we're doing is having an impact or it isn't and we need to change course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Did you notice that kind of, you know, the guiding principles you defined on the beginning stayed with you in the last in the last few months that, you know, that you were on point on the beginning and that you always kind of came back to them? Yeah, definitely. You know, before we ever go um, and try to do try to launch any new programs or policies, we really go back to those and ask ourselves what it's what it's answering. You know, like one of them is we believe that in order to have inclusive inclusive um, team, we need to foster conversations. So before, you know, we'll make sure that um, whatever we're doing is going to impact one of those um, uh, principles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, that's amazing. Um, before my next question, I have sent a question to the audience. Let us know in the polls on the right side if you have already started building your Debbie programs. Um, Amazing. Uh, yeah. So let's let's get to the process building. Right. Because as you know, as the first uh, head of people at a startup or at an upcoming company or basically of, of any team. Right. It kind of usually the people team is the one to tackle um, to tackle this challenge. Um, and I think it might be really helpful for our audience to hear what were some of the programs you decided to launch first at Holler um, or some of the programs you already launched? Kind of what was your thought process there? And, you know, what programs have you launched to, to date? Yeah, there's a, a long list of these. <laughs> so, um, you know, with, uh, with the timing of the work that we uh, started doing last year, one of the things that we realized is that we wanted to include Juneteenth um, in our holiday schedule which really mm -hmm. launched a, a larger conversation or opened up a larger conversation about our current holiday schedule and 
um, and how we wanted to make sure that we were supporting, um, you know, all of the different cultures in the company. And so we we played around with some ideas. I know a lot of companies have success with doing um, like having a flexible holiday schedule and just, you know, you choose what days that you take. We actually ended up um, revamping our holiday schedule to include what we're calling rotating holidays, but that we have off as a company. So this year we're, um, we have um, Rosh Hashanah off and we have Diwali off, um, two holidays that we haven't had previously and we may not have next year. Um, but we wanted to you know, uh, take a moment to celebrate, um, educate ourselves on, on you know, the cultural celebrations around the holidays, why they're important to um, our team members. And then you know, in 2022, we'll, um, we'll have different holidays so that we can make sure you know, that we're, we're learning um, about as many cultures as we can. Um, so that was one of the kind of early quick things that we did that didn't didn't take a lot, but um, you know, hopefully we'll have some impact. We both of those holidays are at the second half of this year, so we haven't um, celebrated them yet, but we're looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, we we also launched our first um, ERG that we call our um, uh, diversity task force, and you know we didn't have anything like that in place. Um, I think it's important that employees are involved, so we did that um, relatively early on. I would say in the first few months. Um, it's similar, I guess, to the holiday schedule. We also launched um, educational days. So we reserve two days a year that the company will close and we'll either use it for education purposes um, on the topic or um, volunteering in the community. Um, so mm -hmm. we've already done a couple of those. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also started to, I think a big kind of topic that we that has been a need from the, from the get go and still is today is really just like education. Um, I think a lot of people just don't know how to get educated or, you know, want resources for education. So we held town halls um, to top, talk about various topics um, early on. So we had one mm -hmm. about race, race in America. You know, our CEO um, I mentioned is uh, black and he did a conversation on what his experience was like growing up. He grew up um, in the south of the U.S. And, and kind of what that experience was. We had another where we had um, where we talked about what it was like to be a woman in the workplace and specifically in the tech industry and how that may be different, um, a different experience for some. Um, so we did that. Um, we've done we've done things like audits, um, you know, really looking at the programs and the policies that we have in place today and trying to understand where we can make those better. So, um, you know, one of the audits that we did was our benefits and Mm -hmm. trying to understand, you know, are our benefits inclusive? Are they um, supporting everybody in our organization? And we actually just added um, fertility and family planning benefits as a result of mm -hmm. that. Um, so I think that was a good thing that came out of doing that audit. Um, and then one last example I'll give is we did a pay equity analysis and kind of like an analysis on how we um, evaluate promotions and career development in the company um, and made some changes to our internal process based on that. So I think it's, you know, it, it is about programs to launch, um, and I think that's, I'm sure there's plenty of, of programs to launch in every organization, but I think equally as important is really evaluating what you have today and making sure that it's inclusive to everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, that's amazing. And that's really a list of programs, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you mentioned on the beginning. Um, what was the feedback with some of the first programs that you have launched? Because uh, I know you mentioned that you were kind of collecting and uh, feedback and surveying the team as you went after building your your first principles uh, and the sort of the baseline for this. Uh, what was some of the feedback, you know, when first launching some of these programs? Because I feel like that's, you know, kind of the, the step that a lot of people teams are afraid of, right? What will happen inside the company once we launch these programs, even though we really want to launch them? Uh, what happened at, uh, at Holler? Yeah, so, you know, we got... I think we have a very vocal team, which is great. You know, we, we mm -hmm. get feedback and we action it. Um, I would say the, the holiday schedule, I think went great. Um, we used to, we, we essentially flipped. Um, we used to have the Friday before July 4th, which is tomorrow. Um, and then the Friday before Memorial day off. And we were like, what, you know, purpose are these serving us? They're not. And um, so we, we um, move those to be the two kind of like rotating holidays in the year. Um, and I think people were excited about that. We got, you know, only good feedback on that. Um, the town halls, I think had a little bit of mixed feedback and, and we, we learned a lot from that. I think it kind of goes back to, again, asking, um, the people at your company to educate everyone else, you know, I, from, I didn't really see it that way. I was like, oh, this is going to be a great way for us to share our experiences with each other. And, um, and, and really, you know, we'll be eye-opening to those that are not in our shoes. You know, my, I, myself as, um, as a woman in leadership, I, I, I shared some experiences that I had, um, but, it, but not everyone felt that way. So that was a good, you know, a bit of feedback um, that we needed to do more external speakers. And then we just did um, 
a couple of weeks ago, we did um, a, a partnership where we did an offsite um, half day learning and we brought in external speakers. And then it ended up kind of naturally being a mix of external speakers, but people sharing in smaller groups their own experiences. And um, mm -hmm. the feedback from that was really great. So um, so good lesson to just, you know, the mixture I think will will really help people feel more more comfortable sharing and and mm -hmm. and of, of course obviously making it an option for them to share or not to share. Amazing, amazing. Um, could you walk us through some of those, uh, some of the programs you have built? You know, who did you include when you started building them? How did you document it? You know, what was what was your process there? Yeah, so I'll stick with the educational day <laughs> since we mm -hmm. since we kind of started there. So, um, you know, I, I think a it was the most impactful program that we've done to date. Um, but we wanted to make sure that, and and I think you know a lot of um, companies may struggle with carving out time to do this work. Um, I think that's, um, I'm in a, a, a diversity group um, and that's a lot of the com comments that we get a lot is like, well, how, you know, how do I convince my leadership that this is, this is worth the time? Um, and I think we, so we really early on wanted to make sure that we ha held space and time um, for education and giving back. Um, that's one of our, you know, actually cut, cuts to two of our four principles. Um, so that was important. So we ended up partnering with um, a group called electives.io um, and they are a uh, great Boston based startup and they're bringing these like interesting engaging speakers to companies on a variety of topics but they have um, speakers for diversity, um, uh, this diversity work. So they recommended a few guest speakers and, um, to get the conversation going at Holler. But I guess to take a step back, so I sat down with my um, CEO and I said, I think this is important. Um, and, and we'd actually gotten this feedback. Um, you know, we do engagement surveys. And one of the, the questions on this topic is, you know, I feel comfortable having tough conversations um, or I, I don't even think it was tough conversations, um, just like conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion with my colleagues. Um, so we, you know, I think it was like a 70 percent um, uh rate. So it wasn't low, but it was low compared to the rest of our scores. So that told me that we needed to focus there. Um, so I talked to my CEO. Um, we kind of came up with this plan to to have external speakers and also to break into smaller groups. Um, we've definitely learned, you know, we're only a 70 person company, but breaking everybody into groups of, you know, 20 to 25 um, really gets conversation moving a lot easier. Um, so we so then we decided to partner with electives um, and we and it was really successful you know we did a company-wide session where we kicked off with an unconscious bias you know kind of workshop um but again really focused on um, the woman who led it who was great telling her own story about how she had been the victim of unconscious bias and how it had impacted her life which i think was just good for people to understand the um you know the implications of that behavior mm -hmm. um and then like i said smaller groups um we broke out to to have conversations around um race um, gender and um, LGBTQ plus. So same thing, you know, these speakers um, have experienced this in their own lives and they were able to share their own experiences, um, you know, resources for how to combat that type of behavior that they'd experienced. And then we heard a lot from, you know, our own internal teams as well. Um, so, you know, I, and I think the, the kind of important part of, of these programs is measuring success. So um, we gave everyone a quick exercise before the event that we called our readiness um, survey, which was, you know, how ready are you to make an impact and, and to, to have these conversations and to, to be, we called the, um, the uh, event be part of the solution. So how ready are you to be part of the solution? Um, and we saw some really impressive results from the pre-survey and then we gave the same one post-survey to see if any behaviors had shifted. Um, mm -hmm. And one of, one of those questions was, um, I like considered how others perceive my contributions to DEI, and that was 59% mm -hmm. uh, agree at the beginning to 90% agree at the um, at the close. So really, just great to see that that these conversations were helpful for people. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I think you know that was that was a really successful program, um, and and I'm sure there are some that I could speak to that were less successful. Um, but mm -hmm. again, I think, you know, getting leadership buy-in, really responding to what the team has asked mm -hmm. for um, is, is going to make, you know, the, the work that you do much more impactful. Absolutely. And I'm so happy that you actually mentioned measuring success because that was one of the mm -hmm. questions we just got in our Q&A from Erica. Um, 
kind of, you know, if I follow up on, on uh, this question a little bit more, how is success defined? Would you say that, you know, the definition of the success during, uh, during you know, the attendance of the different uh, learning sessions would be the improvement? Or did you not define any goals in the beginning and just kind of test it where, um, you know, where things would go? Yeah, so how we how we measure success today is we do engagement surveys every six mm-hmm. months, and we have 10 questions in our wider engagement survey around um, this work. So um, so we do that and, and, and making sure that the, you know, we, we, I think we do a lot in six months. So seeing, you know, if, um, if the if what we're doing is moving the needle is important. Um, so, so we definitely, I would say that's our, the number one way that we measure success, but yeah, we try to, with any of these bigger events that were a bigger lift or, you know, especially when we ask people to take time out of their day, um, to attend something, we always like to do a pre and a post, um, you know, survey so that we can collect feedback and make sure that the efforts, um, you know, that we're putting in are having the outputs that we're hoping for. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think that's amazing. And thank you, Erica, for for the great question. Um, Yeah. What where, you know, there were there has been obviously a lot of different activities and programs that uh, have happened over the past year, as as we can all hear. How do you communicate uh, some of the ongoing changes, um, you know, you're doing with with the rest of the company? Yeah, so for the first six months of this work, we did um, an, a monthly town hall where we would update um, the team on anything that we were doing related to the topic, really, um, and and answer questions and take feedback and all of that. Um, since we we now update the team on like events and happenings through, we have a weekly newsletter called Holler Highlights, um, and it just captures everything that happened in the org this past week and then also looking forward. So we'll, so that's where I I park a lot of that. Um, And then, but we do um, offsites uh, semi-annually and every team um, presents their roadmap and, you know, their measures of success from the last six months. Um, So we'll also do kind of a deeper dive of the programming and and what's been successful there too. Amazing. Uh, That's, I think that's really, really great to kind of combine the um, you know, in, in person sharing versus the online versus the town hall, right? Kind of having multiple resources, sharing the same information is always very important, especially when it when it comes to comes to these programs. Um, what were some of the key steps you found in building these programs that people managers should absolutely not skip? What would be like one uh, one answer there? Yeah. Um- I feel like I've said this already a little bit, but feedback, you know, I, I feel like I can contribute so much of our success in getting listening and actioning feedback from the team. Um, you know, I, my, one of the personal takeaways of, of how, like, I feel like I've developed over the last year is really like taking away that feedback is there for a reason. So it might not be the feedback I was hoping for, um, but it exists and there's a reason that exists. And so there's something there to learn, you know, again, even if it's not what even if you thought that you were doing one thing and, and somebody um, uh, says that they felt it went another way, like there's a reason that they felt that and there's a learning there. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, when you remove, and, and I think that's hard because I, I think as people ops professionals, we're probably all want to please everyone, you know, and, and, and I think that's like kind of a common um, theme in this profession is you can't please everyone, um, but you can learn from everything. So, you know, as mm-hmm. soon as you can kind of remove the personal aspects, like, oh, I put so much work into that, like, why didn't it land the same way? Um, and mm-hmm. really just be, um, be able to, to digest it and learn from it. I think it's, it's the way to be much more successful in, in the space generally, but you know, um, also in the diversity space. Absolutely. I, I love that. Um, you can't please everyone, but you can learn from anything. I think that's, uh, that's an amazing, uh, amazing thought. Um, and I have another question for our audience, and that is, who is building your diversity, inclusion, and belonging programs? You can vote now in the polls. And I actually have the same question for you, Brittany. Who should be involved <laughs> in implementing and running these uh, these programs? Yeah, so you know, it truly needs to be a group effort by the org. Um, and what I mean by that is I mentioned earlier, leadership needs to be bought in, they need to be aligned. And the people team needs to be aligned with not only leadership, but also the employee base. Um, and then finally, I think the employees have have a, have a great responsibility to drive change too. Um, you know, they, they have to be um, open to um, accepting the uh, 
you know, learning and opportunity and developmental um, things that are being given, they need to be open to giving feedback um, so that we can continue to hone um, the approach and make sure that they're getting everything that they need to out of the, the uh, content. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, the biggest kind of learning for me over this past year is probably just how much each person in the organization can make an impact and make a difference. You know, mm. um, in this recent offsite that we just did that I mentioned earlier, the most consistent feedback that we got was how inspired our team felt after they were listening to their team members stories. You know, just by mm-hmm. having these conversations, we suddenly felt so much closer to our team members. We had more empathy for them. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of stories that have stuck with me so deeply. Um, and I think about them all the time and I'm like, wow, I can't believe that this person went through that. Um, and just by them sharing that story, um, you know, they've made a profound impact on my life and made me want to take action in ways that I may not have um, before. So it's just, you know, there's, there's, it's so easy to have a big impact, um, you know, even mm-hmm. as just an individual contributor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um after you, um, and thank you so much for, for sharing that, after you kind of, you know, on the beginning, we talked about um, you building your ground p- principles, taking a stance, kind of doing like the first rounds of initial communication and training. Um, how is that work continuing? I feel like you partially answered answered that question already. Um, but I thought, you know, is there is there anything that you have been continuing working on uh, after launching uh, the DIB programs at Holler? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, after that kind of initial communication went out, we did the first few things we and we got all the feedback that we felt like we could collect at that point. Um, we really like we got right to work. You know, we um, we knew that we wanted to make a meaningful change um, in our company. And so I really kind of set out to do research on the topic. Um, you know, I personally didn't have I had little to no experience building these programs before. And that's where I always go to people communities and try to you know, read articles and, and learn about what's, um, what are best practices and how should we approach it. Um, and you know, what I found is we ha- there's a lot of information out there on DEI, um, but the vast majority that I was finding was coming from big companies, you know, the Googles of the world with ample resources. You know, they're able to build all these great in-depth programs. Um, but I wasn't finding much or a community for those small, fast growing kind of purpose driven companies that I think Holler is. Um, so what we actually did is we created um, a website called dibsource.com and that was born to really fill that void. So what it is, is it's an open source project that we're continuously updating. Um, and we share, you know, in detail what we did at Holler, um, what works, we're honest about what didn't. Um, and we also will highlight you know, different partners that we're using that are helping us to achieve our goals. Um, so essentially, you know, we've created, it's, it's a website, um, but we've created the space uh, to fuel practical, real solutions that everyone um, can contribute to and everyone can try in their own organizations if they feel like that will be impactful. Um, and, you know, we've had a number of companies kind of share their own ideas on the platform. Um, but now that we have um, some content, we're really looking at the future of what that platform can be you know, how we can get it into more hands, how we can diversify the content. And I think that will, I know that will continue to be an ongoing um, program for us because there's a lot that can be said there. You know, I find a lot of times mm-hmm. um, when I'm on, when I'm reading articles, I feel like they're making high level recommendations, you know, talk to your leadership, um, create an ERG, but it's like, and, and so this, this um, website really goes into details. Like here's all the things that we took into consideration. Here's exactly all the steps that we took to do so. So I'm hoping that it will provide a little bit more of a guide. Again, every company is different and what works for us isn't necessarily going to work elsewhere. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's why creating that community and and um, and adding content from different companies is so important so that you can get some different viewpoints of how other companies are approaching it. Absolutely. And I know that you're sharing your own story of building these programs there as well in in different blog posts. Uh, And so thank you so much for putting that amazing resource together. I have shared it with everyone in the chat. If you're interested in checking out um, the IP source, it's it's there for you uh, in the chat. Um, Amazing. We actually have a question, uh, another question before we move on from the audience. Um, And that is, uh, you know, when uh, implementing 
and building these programs. Uh, have you experienced uh, any challenges bringing people along? Uh, we have varying amount of amounts of buying, cross departments, tenure, etc., which has resulted in some uh, in some versus kind of you know the, the detentions inside inside the teams. So, what was your experience in uh, you know in in launching all of the programs and have you experienced any uh, any tension or any any challenges during that time? Yeah, I mean, definitely. We've um, I feel like we've experienced some things along the way. So, you know, I, I know I keep going back to this, but getting the leadership team aligned, I think, is, is so important. And it really starts with the CEO. So I think, you know, first and foremost, you have to really get your CEO to understand all of the really great things that can come out of doing this work. Um, and I know that can take some time and that's actually like a really good blog post now that I'm thinking about it on how we, how we approach <laughs> that. Um, you know, we, we, I was lucky there. My CEO um, is, is really, as soon as everything happened, he knew that we needed to make a change. He knew how important it was. He wanted to be a little bit of like an industry leader in this. And he's mm -hmm. one of the few, you know, black um, tech CEOs in the space. So he has, he has a voice that we really wanted to capture. So I was definitely lucky in that way. You know, I'll say not every single leader that I've ever worked with has been as, um, you know, bought in on it and, and not, you know, I, I don't feel like not bought in as in they don't think the work is important, but, you know, we work in small agile startups that we, there's a lot to get done. And so any kind of distraction, um, you know, can, can be stressful, I think, especially for leaders who have big goals that they need to complete and KPIs that they need to deliver. Um, you know, what I would say to that is get your, um, employees involved on, on kind of the ground level. So like leadership and then employees. Um, and have employees kind of really create some of the strategy. So, you know, our, our task force that we have for the topic, they do they do a lot of the like events um, planning around, you know, the, um, we, so we just celebrated um, on Tuesday, we did a um, an ice cream, a social at Big Gay Ice Cream in New York and Seaport, which is uh, like on the water. And our uh, task force created that event and, and created interest around it. You know, so having other um, people sprinkled throughout the organization on different teams that can really talk up the events and really, um, you know, the impact of them, I think is helpful. Um, so, I, so I think you have to kind of uh, find out where some of those maybe tough spots are and, and really like hone in on them. So maybe you have somebody on the task force that's on one of those teams and they can talk to the leader about how important the work is, or maybe, you know, you need to, to really spend some time with the CEO to figure out how do we communicate out to the rest of the leadership team, how important this is and why, um, you know, our expectations is that everyone's um, bought in and attending and participating and all that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing the answer. And thank you for the question. It was it was really a great and a tough one as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you kind of mentioned, you know, building those initial values and, and programs on on the beginning, and then kind of moving along, you know, and the, and doing other activities in this area as well. How how often do you go back um, either to those principles or to those programs? For example, to the new benefit structure you have built. Um, how often do you go back and kind of check in to understand, you know, if everything is still aligned with with the company's uh, vision for this? Yeah, so you know, anytime we're adding new strategy or new execution as it relates to um, DEI, but also, you know, I do, I, I generally do about every year um, a review of the process and the procedures that we have in place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we don't dedicate a whole week to just reviewing everything, but you know, as things come up, I, I'll, I'll ask myself, have we looked at how we're doing this recently? And you know, an, an example I'll give there is we just. Um, and, it, and it's a small thing, but we are in a big hiring push right now. So we knew we'd mm -hmm. have a bunch of people coming on in over the summer. And I, so I wanted to really like comb through our onboarding process and fine tune it and look for places, you know, that, that we could make better outside of DEI, but also really looked at it through the lens of inclusivity. Um, and, and I, I quickly found that we weren't really um, collecting any sort we weren't collecting pronouns um, during the onboarding process. And, you know, I thought every every week in our holler highlights were, um, you know, announcing new hires and using pronouns in those um, in those announcements. So why aren't we, you know, making sure that we're using the correct pronouns? So just mm -hmm. a really quick tweak. But, you know, when we have them send um, their bio, you know, we don't use pronouns to to talk about them um, ahead of this. But when they arrive, we ask them for their bio their pronouns. And then when we actually announce them, we use the correct pronouns. So, you know, mm -hmm. again, very small, but, you know, we'll make new hires mm -hmm. feel more inclusive. And, and I think those are, those are big opportunities that are a, a very small lift. 
Absolutely. And I'm so happy you're sharing this because it, it does not, you know, taking the first step into building any kind of these programs. It's just, you know, firstly, kind of understanding what needs to happen, how you want, like, what's the ideal state and what are your values going in? And then just taking, you know, a step by step and going little by little every day and improving the current programs and the future programs you currently have at the organization and, and building them and moving them forward. Um, yeah, I have I have a final question before we move to our Q&A, um, where we have quite a lot of questions uh, mm -hmm. coming from the audience, which is amazing. Um, so my final question for you, uh, Brittany, would be, is uh, diversity, uh, inclusion and belonging a part of your culture now? Would you say that it has truly become a part of uh, the culture at Holler? Yeah, and very much so. Like, at least, and I hope that everybody in the organization would answer that the same. I know I'm a little, um, you know, biased mm -hmm. there, but you know, I think it was clear really early on that these diversity efforts have to be visible in all areas of the organization, um, or they wouldn't be successful. So, you know, having an ERG is nice, but is that going to solve pay issues or like larger issues like pay equity? No. Is and and you know on the flip side, is having a pay equity strategy going to solve for employee belonging? No. So we really need to look at kind of every aspect of what I'll call the employee experience, and that's kind of how we how we mapped out our programming too. Is we said okay, from the first time someone learns about Holler until the day that they leave Holler, and even beyond when they're keeping up with Holler, you know what what are the what are what's happening along the way? And we really looked at through each of those lenses how um, you know DEI was was a part of that, and and it's a part of it in so many ways. You know, I'll give we have a um, a tool um, that's like a, a bias scanner, and so it's a web plugin that you can um, scan you know the text that you've written for potential like bias words, um, and mm -hmm. so you know like performance reviews may not feel like a time where you can do a lot with DEI, but you know, we, we have everyone use that scanner to make sure that feedback they're giving, you know, um, their direct reports or their peer feedback is, um, is inclusive language. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we also looked at how we do promotions and how can we make that more um, inclusive mm -hmm. and equitable. Um, so really in, in every kind of point along the employee experience, um, there are, there is an opportunity to look at it through that lens. And I think that is how it truly gets ingrained in your culture. You know, it's not just in one place, it's in all of these different areas that you um, that you have an experience at Holler. So, and, and we mm -hmm. haven't finished that. That is a huge, huge um, undertaking. You know, I would say we're probably through 60% of those things that happen while you're in a company. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, this, I, I, I feel like this is said a lot in this space, but this isn't overnight work. You know, you can't just uh, fix it. And even when you, when we get through that entire employee experience, you know, process. And we're, we're like, okay, we have diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of these different places. You know, it's, the work will always be ongoing. It's changing every day. Um, you know, we're, we're learning new information, new resources every day. So there's always going to be something to do. This is not mm -hmm. one of those things where it's like, okay, we need to redo our performance reviews and you check the box. It's like, this is ongoing work that always has to be a, a point of focus for, you know, the people team, but also the leadership team as well. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. Um, and thank you for that, for that great answer. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's go move to our Q&A now. Uh, the first question we have is coming from Sally. And the question is uh, whether you have uh, built any programs related to peer recognition. Yeah, so we have um, the way that we do this right now is our our performance review process is, is not, we don't call them performance reviews, we call them monthly syncs. And so we have um, each person, you know, give their own feedback on themselves about how they, how they're performing on a continuous basis, but we do it monthly to make sure, you know, there's no, I, I, I hate to think that somebody would wait six months to get that feedback. And I would like to think that we have, you know, managers that wouldn't do that, but I think it's always just nice to, to check in a little bit more frequently. So we actually do peer, um, uh, feedback as part of that. And um, I'm responsible for asking for uh, feedback from my peers at least twice a year, um, but we mm -hmm. recommend quarterly. Um, and so that's a way to get feedback. Um, and and a lot of times people will post those recognitions like more publicly or share them with that person's direct manager. Um, but we also do something else um, that where we do quarterly um, living the values. So we have we have three key behaviors, which are essentially values. And every mm -hmm. quarter we have a little submission tool where, you know, you can submit that 
um, you know, one of your colleagues really love this value, give an example. Um, and then we announce those on a all hands meeting. Um, mm-hmm. So just like, you know, a fun way to make sure that um, our values are, are really front and center and everybody knows what they are and everyone knows, what, um, you know, that people that live them get rewarded. So that's a, that was a quick thing that we just launched, but, um, um, but it, the team has been really receptive to it. Amazing. And I'm sorry we were not able to share that question on the screen. I'm not sure why that happened, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to see I all the other questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, the next question is coming from Erica. Uh, do you have any programs initiative to address uh, equity specifically? Yes. So um, I talk about this um, in, in depth in the blog as well. So if you're interested in this topic, there's a couple of great posts on this. Um, so what we what we did it from a pay equity perspective is we we started by ensuring that we had salary bands for each um, level in each organization. So we have ten levels at Holler um, from you know junior role um, all the way up to the the chief level, um, and we have identified salary bands for those roles, which we again look at year over year because um, you know those change, and we want to make sure that we're that we have salaries that are. Um, competitive in the recruiting space, but also internally, we want to make sure um, that we're paying people equitably. Mm -hmm. Um, So we did that. And then we mapped everybody in the current org um, against those salary bands and looked for any um, issues in equity. Um, You know, we were, we were pleasantly surprised to see that there weren't any because we didn't really have a process on how we identified what salary should be moving, you know, or anything like that prior to this. Um, but again, we're a 60 person company um, or 70 now, but at the time we did this, we were 60. Um, so it was relatively easy to do. But I think what's important is getting those types of things in place now so that as you grow, um, you every person that you bring in is is matched to those and you can make sure that you're hiring people equitably and you're paying people for the same um, you know work that they're doing. Um, so we did that. And then another thing that we did, which I, I quickly mentioned earlier, is our promotion process. So you know, pre- previous to our changes, we had a form. And um, if I wanted to promote one of my direct reports, I would go in and I fill out this form, you know, here's how this person's mm-hmm. performing, this is the request I have for them, it would go to me, I'd approve it through finance, and then it would be done. Um, so we recently changed that to, to a, I think a big part of equitable promotions is being honest about how you evaluate people. Um, you know, different managers may have different evaluation metrics for how they um, mm-hmm. elevate employees within the organization. And I wanted to a make that consistent, but b make that public. So we shared with everybody, here's what the here's what the form looks like when your manager um, requests a, a promotion for you now. And they were things like, how does this person live our values? Um, do, is this cr- person a culture participant? Meaning, do they attend um, trainings and education um, events? You know, those aren't all things that will be you know, detrimental to their ability to get promoted. But these are things that we, you know, if we're promoting somebody into a management position, we want them to be an advocate for a culture, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, We also, you know, our monthly syncs, we look back, like, are people getting peer feedback? Are they, um, Mm -hmm. are they investing in themselves? Are they using the the learning and development tools that we offer? Um, So those are all kind of like, uh, what I'll say is data points for promotions. So essentially now we have a manager complete that, it gets routed to me, and then I do an evaluation of anybody else who is eligible for that promotion. So if we have somebody moving in the org from an L2 to an L4, for example, or sorry, an L3 to an L4, then I'll go back and see who else is at an L3. And you know, if I did all of this work on them, would they also be um, eligible? And so it's really just a checks and balances system to make sure that um, we're evaluating talent the correct way and, um, and, and we can feel like when we do make promotion um, efforts or when we do make promotions, our efforts are equitable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, all righty, uh, our next question is what are, cause you actually mentioned this uh, kind of in the middle of our conversation. Uh, what are some of your favorite people communities to discuss topics like like these ones? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, A, I read the um, People People newsletter. I think those are great. Um, <laughs> So I, I read all that um, information there. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the Belt for Human, or I Love Humans Lattice um, community. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of like check a lot of my work there and make sure that, uh, see if other companies are doing something similar, if they've already seen that it wasn't successful. Um, and then I recently just uh, joined Benny's HR advisory. Um, and I think, you know, Lattice is, is a great tool because there's so much there. Um, it's a little bit harder to keep up with. So um, I thought the this other uh, platform would be good to have as just like another uh, resource. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and thank you so much for mentioning our, our people, people community. Uh, we tackle different topics every week, um, but we just recently actually launched an article on the DIB source, uh, which we're very proud to to share with with everyone that's uh, that's reading uh, that resource. So, uh, thank you so much for mentioning and for the opportunity as well. Um, Amazing. All right, we have our, our final question uh, from James. And the question is, uh, how do you think offering, um, do you think that, you know, offering mental health benefits uh, that are inclusive and work for everyone? Do you think that that's possible or do you have that experience uh, within, uh, within Holler? Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is a really important topic. We, um, mm. and especially during, you know, everything that everyone has, has been through, um, so, you know, this was part of our benefits analysis. We wanted to understand um, how, what our health plans were offering um, all of our employees for mental health benefits. So we did an analysis on that and made sure that it was, um, it was inclusive. Um, you know, I think uh, another thing that we've done internally on this topic is, is um, education around it. So we partner with um, a company called Recalibrate. They're um, a mindfulness uh, company out of Austin. And, you know, they've done, we've, we did the thing that we did most recently that, that the team really liked is we had a conversation with like, kind of a fireside chat like this for our team um, about, you know, how do you go about finding the right therapist? Like if you are, um, if you don't have the means to, to pay for a therapist, like what are some options that you have available there? So I think those kind of educational opportunities are really important for employees. Um, you know, even, um, and, and, and it's, and it's, you know, what does a therapist do? Like, what can you expect from them, you know, if you've never done it before? Because I think a lot of times that can be a feel like mm -hmm. a little bit of a hurdle for people, you know, where do I even start? Um, so I think mm -hmm. that conversation was good, you know, because of COVID, um, uh, our health insurance co companies, I think are waiving the first 10 sessions. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been like promoting that and kind of shouting that from the rooftops internally, too. But it's definitely, um, you know, an important topic and, and one that we should all be thinking about and, and, you know, well beyond COVID is, you know, how do we maintain having, being able to offer benefits like that to our employees? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this was a great question to close our today's discussion with. So thank you everyone so much for sharing the questions in our Q&A and voting in all of our polls. And Brittany, I especially wanted to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, it was amazing to hear all the work you have done at Holler so far. I think you and your team are a great inspiration to, to all of us. Um, we have shared the DIB source in the chat again, uh, just sharing uh, that with everyone. If you want to check out the website, Website, please do. Uh, and I'll also share uh, the links to our LinkedIn uh, for Brittany and myself in case you want to get in touch. Uh, please do. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have on this uh, topic. Uh, so please feel, feel free to reach out to us. So I've just shared that in the chat again. Again, uh, Brittany, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It was It was great to have you. Yeah, of course. I'm, I love this topic. So thanks for having me. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm happy to chat or, um, you know, if anybody has any I, anything that they want to share that their own teams have done um, on DibSource, again, it's open open um, community platform. So um, happy to happy to share some of your learnings as well as you go through this work. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>